Thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to uh, have this, the opportunity to give this uh, uh, presentation. So um, I'm actually uh, 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 more an expert of kinetic theory. Um, and I recently ga came into game theory because, uh, because of mean field games. And uh, the, uh, there seems to be a fantastic uh, uh, playground there. And that's a joint work with uh, Jan Goliou from Duke University and Christine Ringofer from Arizona State. Um, OK, so um, I've, I've been uh, discussing a lot with uh, uh, some uh, friends uh, who uh, started from the physics side of the, say, applied mathematics. And then they were hired in an economics university. And so sort of to show their, you know, the, uh, you know that they were good economics people, they were sort of rejecting completely the mechanistic viewpoint and uh, uh, taking the uh, rational agent viewpoint, right? So they were, they were saying that for social sciences, you know, uh, using the description of agents is like particles submitted to forces and so on is, is, not, is not correct, that, you know, people are rational agents and they, have ma they are making decisions based on a utility function that tries to optimize something. And uh, so he was, uh, so you, he was uh, criticizing, I'm not going to say who he, who he is, but uh, he was criticizing a lot of this, uh, new fields of social physics or economic, econophysics where people apply physics, you know, based ideas on uh, systems of social dynamics and economics. And, um, and, and so, uh, my, my, my feeling is that at this point that was a kind of a matter of taste and it in, in turns out that when we tried to think about it, uh, we, could actually try, we could actually propose a way to reconcile these two viewpoints and uh, trying to show that, you know, it's the same thing, it depends on the way you look at it, right? So, so this is what I've said here. So there are so two, two viewpoints about social or biological agents. Either you can look at them as mechanical particles subjected to forces. A typical example is pedestrians. So there is a, the first, the first uh, uh, model for pedestrian dynamics is uh, due to a physicist called Dirk Helbing. And uh, the model is called the social force model. So this is exactly what it says, that pedestrians are you know, uh, subjected to forces, you know, repulsing, repulsion forces when they meet an obstacle, attraction force when they want to uh, see uh, what's happening there, and so on and so forth, right? And then the second, ask, the second viewpoint is uh, trying to view the agents, the rational agents, trying to optimize a goal. And again, in pedestrian dynamics, now there is a trend to actually use the concepts of game theory to describe uh, pedestrian dynamics. And as I said, our goal was to try to reconcile these viewpoints and show that kinetic theory can deal with rational agents and uh, vice versa, that uh, looking at rational agents is somehow not very different as from looking at, at, at say, forces and, and, and particles. Uh, one uh, outcome of this is that then you can try to sort of cross-fertilize the uh, two, uh, two, uh, the, the two uh, domains. And in particular, in economics, economics is, uh, is mostly a theory of equilibrium. Yeah? So, you know, demand and, and supply and so on. And there is, of course, uh, more and more time dynamics in economics, but still, uh, I mean, most of economics, the pillar is equilibrium. And so it's somehow uh, kind of uh, a little bit too narrow in some sense, and the idea of using kinetic theory methods in, 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 in economics is actually an idea that allows us to incorporate, in some sense, time dynamics into the, uh, into the theory. Right? So these are very, uh, uh, very general ideas. 
So in fact, this uh, viewpoint studied as, as I said, by looking at studies on pedestrians and so this work by Dirk Helbing and recently a, a model by actually Helbing too and Musaid and Ferolas who were uh, proposed a, another model based on more on the rational agent kind of approach and which we have uh, used to uh, sort of uh, elaborate our our theory then we have looked at social herding behavior and some economics and I'll try to to go through briefly at the end right so so that's the motivation right so let's try to uh, the first thing I'd like to show is that in some sense a Nash equilibrium and a kinetic equilibrium or a thermodynamic equilibrium for those who are familiar with statistical physics are somehow similar right are actually equivalent isomorphic so that's the idea. So let me try to uh, propose the setup. Um, so I'm considering, first I'm going to look at the discrete setting and then I'm going to go to the continuum setting. So I'm sort of a mean field limit of this discrete setting. So I'm considering n players, the numbers one to n. Each, each player has a strategy yj in a sub-strategy space Y, I suppose that all, all the strategies are in the same space for simplicity, and each player has a cost function, uh, but when it plays strategy Y, YJ, in the presence of the others, other players playing strategy YJ hat. So in, in actually in game theory, usually this vector of all strategies, but the one that you consider is called Y minus J, right? But I call it YJ hat. So the cost function is a function of your own strategy and the strategy of the others. And of course, the, the game theory is about minimizing your cost function. I'm actually uh, speaking of cost function rather than utility because I prefer minimizing rather than ma maximizing. Uh, but it's the same, of course. So I'm trying to minimize my cost function uh, um, by playing on my own strategy variables, not touching the others' strategy variables. And uh, I achieve a Nash equilibrium when I find a uh, n tuple of, of a strategy such that for any of these strategies, then I get a minimum of the uh, corresponding cost function, right? When I do not touch the other strategy, right? So this is this is a Nash equilibrium, right? So this is and. Uh, as you know, subjected to conditions, and uh, uh, then there is at least a, a one, uh, one Nash equilibrium. Uh, as, as Eve uh, uh, has said uh, previously, the uh, existence of a Nash equilibrium is a topological uh, fixed point theorem, right? So uh, uh, it's, um, and we will see how the concept of fixed point theorem will arise later when we speak of thermodynamical equilibrium. Okay, so here we, um, we have, uh, we wanted to introduce the time dynamic, so instead of trying to instantaneously minimize the cost function, we sort of imagine that the players follow a strategy in time, which is essentially to move uh, a continuous time variable corresponding to their strategy along to a gradient descent of their cost function, uh, phi j, the gradient with respect to yj of phi j with the other variables fixed. So this is called the best reply strategy. And we also uh, wanted to add noise to account for uncertainties. So basically uh, each uh, player, I think it's called the idiosyncratic noise, each player has its own kind of source of uncertainty. It's not a common noise which is, turns out to be more complicated. Each, each of the noises here is independent of the other, right? So each is, uh, so then we get this uh, stochastic differential equation. And when uh, going to an infinite number of players, I'm assuming that each player has a very say, small influence on the, on the, on the, on the whole uh, set of players so that I can describe the, um, uh, agents by only by their probability distribution in the strategy space. So I consider that the game is anonymous in the sense that I do not need to know who is playing what. What I need to know only is how many players do play this strategy Y. Uh, the, um, 
I, I assume that it's a continuum of players, and that means that this, this probability distribution is actually absolutely continuous with respect to, the, say, the Lebesgue measure on the strategy space Y. I suppose that Y now is, is a subset of, of an interval of R or an open set of RD. And uh, it's uh, non-atomic in the, in the sense that, it's a non-atomic also in the sense that it's absolutely continuous. And, uh, um, and also in the sense that now the cost function is a function of your own strategies and the strategy of the other players, but the strategy of the player, other players is encoded into the distribution of strategies. And I do not have to remove my own strategy because my own strategy is, is of zero measure say, in the set of strategies. So it doesn't count whether I remove it or not. So essentially, my cost function is a, is a function of my own strategy and the distribution of strategies, F. Right? So that's the uh, uh, continuum of players. And that's a general framework, which is actually already uh, has already some uh, big history behind with uh, works by Oman, Mascolet, Schmeidler, Shapiro and Chaplin, and others. Uh, a, good, a good collection of these people are Nobel Prizes in economics. And in some sense, related to the concepts of mean field gain that's been uh, put forward by Lasserie and Lyons and Cardaliaghi, and also by uh, Malamé and co workers independently of Lasserie and Lyons. Right? Okay, so in this framework, what is a uh, Nash equilibrium? But basically, it's a Nash equilibrium if you find a distribution of uh, strategies such that the cost function is constant on the support of this distribution. So that means that on the support of this distribution, I have no gain in changing my strategy to something else, right? So this basically means that all the cost, the cost function is constant on the support of the strategy uh, distribution, and away from the support, then the cost function is higher, meaning that I have no gain in you know, going to outside the support of, of F. Right? So that's, that's, the, that's the, the definition of a Nash equilibrium for a continuum of players. It turns out it's equivalent to a kind of what's called the mean field equation, which is basically saying that uh, this quantity with f and here is minimizes this quantity where you have f here, but you keep f and here, right? So, um, so this is Nash equilibrium, right? So now, if I go into the best reply strategy in this continuum uh, setting, then well, basically, I'm going to take the Ito uh, um, uh, the Ito formula of this uh, stochastic differential equation. So I'm going to get a Fokker-Planck equation in uh, space Y um, with uh, uh, mean field phi. So this is how I'm going to uh, get this equation. So the, now the uh, strategy distribution f of Y depends on T and evolves in time according to so this is the best reply strategy. So I'm going to uh, uh, move along the steepest descent direction of the cost function phi f, right? So this is a motion in y space. So this is just uh, first of the uh, partial differential equation, which, which translates the transport of f along these, uh, these trajectories. And then the noise term adds up into this diffusion here, right? And phi f is a shorthand notation for the cost function as a function of y, where f is, is, the, is, is the parameter in, in, inside the cost function. So you see that here you have a nonlinear a nonlinearity because phi depends on f, and f is the unknown itself, right? So that's a... Um, so I'm not going to, to discuss the existence and uh, solutions of this. Actually, if you, if you set up, if you cook up the right conditions of phi, then you get existence of solutions and so on. But uh, this is not really the, 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 the subject here. So here we have a, a Fokker-Planck equation. So it's something that's familiar in kinetic theory. So in, uh, in say, statistical physics, where you have, yeah, say, particles. So suppose that y now is space or velocity, and particles are some material particles. 
And so that's the distribution of these particles, and they evolve in space according to, that's called the, this, 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 this uh, combination of these two operators is called the collision operator. So usually you have uh, two uh, antagonist effects, so there is a noise which sort of, sort of spreads the particles, but then there is the so-called interaction term that sort of uh, clusters the particles together, and then there is a kind of a, equilibrium between these two phenomena that produces some, some, some structures, some, uh, some structures. So for instance, we will see some examples later. And so when you collect these two operators, then you get what's called the collision operator in, in kinetic theory that describes how particles interact with each other, right? So you see that already, you know, uh, we can, you can, you start to see an analogy between these, uh, you know, uh, game theory concepts and and mechanistic concepts. So now a uh, classical uh, object in kinetic theory is to look at the equilibrium of these equations. So basically as the zeros of this uh, collision operator Q, and these are called the kinetic equilibria, or also thermodynamical equilibria, let's call them kinetic equilibria, Ke. And they are very easy to, to find, right? Because this is, a, you can write it as a divergence of uh, grad I, y phi f plus d grad y f, right? So if you, uh, maybe I could, I could uh, just do the, the simple computation for you here. So you have q of f that you can write as the divergence in y of the grad of y phi f times f plus d uh, grad y f, so if I put f in factor, I can write it like this, right? And so if I'm, if I'm looking at this, this is nothing but the gradient of phi f plus d times the log of f, right? And if you're saying that this quantity is zero, that means that uh, phi f plus d log f is a constant, right? So that means that f, so if this, if this is zero, that implies that f is going to be minus, um, minus, uh, sorry, sorry, exponential minus the phi f divided by the noise, and you have a constant, right, which uh, appears in front, and since you have a probability, then the constant is adjusted so that you get a probability, right? So you get that naturally, the, na the natural equilibria are what we call Gibbs measures, so there's just the exponential of minus the potential divided by the noise, and normalize in such a way that you get a probability. And um, they are, the only thing is that phi depends on f, right? Phi depends on f. So in fact here, uh, phi depends on f, and this is f. So when you recompute the phi from this guy, you should find this one. So you have a fixed point problem, right? Because you need that the phi constructed on this guy matches this one in order to get an equilibrium, right? So in general, using this trick, you can write the collision operator. In fact, using, you can rewrite this collision operator using this in this form. The divergence of this um, uh, Gibbs equilibrium associated with a potential phi f times the gradient of f of mf, right? So it's easy to see that if you compute this quantity, then you get something which has a sign using Green's formula, so that you see that if Q is equal to zero, that has to be equal to zero. Since this guy is, has a sign, that means that the gradient of F over MF has to be zero, so F has to be proportional to M, M phi F, right? So this is a proof, of course, here, you could argue that, okay, I have said that this is equal to zero, but it's not exactly this has to be zero, it's the divergence of this is to be zero. But it turns out that provided you put, a, put, put the, the right regularity of uh, spaces, then it's the same. 
And this is basically the regularity that you have to put is the one that allows you to apply Green's formula here. And then you get that the only equilibria are those which are the Gibbs equilibria, provided that if I take the uh, F, I construct the phi, I take the Gibbs equilibrium, I recover the F. So here you see I have a fixed point equation in F. And uh, you can express this fixed point equation in phi just by saying that the potential phi has to be the one that's originate from the Gibbs equilibrium on phi. So you have a fixed point problem. And remember, uh, finding a Nash equilibrium is also a fixed point problem. So it's not very surprising that at some point we find the same, uh, the same thing, right? So uh, the equilibrium for the kinetic, kinetic equilibrium is a Gibbs distribution that satisfies this, right? So now the question is, now what's the relation between the Nash equilibrium and the Gibbs equilibrium that I've just shown? So in order to find this relation, I'm going to modify a little bit the game. So instead of taking the game with the cost function phi f, I'm going to add the contribution of, uh, to, the, to the cost function, which is log f. That's a penalization that corresponds to uh, the entropy. Okay, so in some sense, um, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, penalize the, uh, I'm going to penalize the, um, uh, just too strongly ordered, uh, too strongly ordered states, right? So somehow, and so if, if I increase the D, which is, means increasing the noise, I mean I'm going to look for uh, a game where I put more and more uh, cost into the, into the noise, right? So this time, I'm, I'm changing a little bit the noise and I introduce uh, the cost and I'm going to introduce this new cost function, mu, which is phi plus d log f. So now I'm, I'm just assuming very, uh, very uh, um, weak regularity on phi, supposing that phi is just continuous, a continuous function for any f. Actually, I could even, just suppose that it's locally finite for any f. That would be enough. Then what I'm saying is that if I take a kinetic equilibrium associated with this collision operator q, it's going to be a Nash equilibrium associated to the game with this cost function mu and vice versa, right? Uh, so it's very easy to prove, actually. It looks like uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a very, very shallow, it's a very shallow theorem. So suppose that I have a kinetic equilibrium. So I have a function f, which satisfies that it is the Gibbs equilibrium associated with the potential phi associated with itself. Suppose I have a guy like this, right? Okay, so I can write this Gibbs distribution like this. This is the definition, right? And since my uh, potential phi is a continuous function, right, it's locally finite, so this guy is strictly positive, right? So that means that the support of uh, so that means that the support of this is is the whole uh, range of y. Say, for instance, the real line, right? Now, if I take the uh, cost function associated with this guy, in fact, if I take uh, phi plus d the log of this guy, so if I take the log, I get a minus phi, which is going to cancel this phi. And the only thing that remains is the log of z, which is a constant. So you see, I get that the cost function is a constant for all y, and all y is also the support of this distribution, right? So that means that this guy is a Nash equilibrium for the game with cost function mu f, because it matches this definition here. Here. It really matches this definition. It is equal to this cost function is a constant for all the support of the distribution, and the support of the distribution is everything because it's, it's, it's always strictly positive, right? So it is a Nash equilibrium. And now vice versa, suppose I have a Nash equilibrium. So it's, it's, uh, so it's uh, going to be, so the first thing is that I notice that the, uh, this, this Nash equilibrium has to be positive everywhere because if it was zero somewhere, right, then its 
cost function would be minus infinity because the cost function is phi plus d log f. So if f would be zero somewhere, this would be minus infinity and mu would be minus infinity, right? Phi is finite everywhere. Okay, so the, the mu would be minus infinity and since it's Nash equilibrium, the mu would be minus infinity everywhere. And since mu is minus infinity everywhere, that means that f is equal to zero and if f is the constant is minus infinity, f is equal to zero, which is a contradiction because we need that the integral is one because we have a probability. So that means that half has to be strictly positive everywhere, right? Uh, so mu f now is a constant, which is positive. So if mu f is a constant, then you go back to the definition. If mu f is a constant, then you get that this is likely this computation that f is e to the minus phi f over d, so is of the form of a uh, Gibbs distribution, right? Okay, so that implies that f is a kinetic equilibrium. So we really have uh, identity, isomorphism in the, okay, here the important thing is, that, is the noise. If I didn't put the noise, I would be in trouble because this is uh, precisely what allows me to uh, really match the two, the two things, right? So in some sense, the noise uh, uh, would, uh, would uh, sort of get rid of all the singular cases, I would say, right? Okay, so then there is a special case which is of interest, which we have seen, I think, in uh, Eve's talk, is the case of a potential gain. So you could imagine that the cost function is a, a derivative of a, a functional u, uh, that's called the potential gain. So it's a functional derivative. You have a functional u. You, have a you take the functional derivative of u with respect to f. That gives you phi f. And then you can define uh, uh, what's called a free energy. So you take this uh, u and you add the entropy uh, contribution f log f. And then it turns out that you can compute the, the mu f, the, the new cost function here, as the functional derivative of this free energy with respect to f, right? So that means that uh, you can write the collision operator as, which is in general written like this, right? Uh, this is essentially the same computation. Since now the uh, mu is a functional derivative of f with respect to f, you can write it like this, and this is a typical form of a gradient flow in, in the Wasserstein metric. So essentially that means that if you're computing uh, the time derivative of the free energy along the trajectories of this uh, by just a simple, again, uh, integration by parts, you get that uh, minus this quantity which has a sign, which is the uh, free energy dissipation, right? So basically you have a dissipation of the free energy and you have that uh, if you have a Nash equilibrium, which is a case where the mu is a, is, is a constant, so the gradient of mu is equal to zero, that corresponds to a case where this guy is zero, so that corresponds to a critical point of the, uh, of the free energy, subject to the constraint and integral of FTY. Uh, but of course, the critical point doesn't mean a minimum, okay? So uh, you may have uh, Nash equilibrium Nash equilibria that are not minima, but, 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 uh, but higher, higher minima or, or even uh, saddle points and things like that. But, uh, okay, this gives an interesting perspective. Of course, it's a very special case because uh, uh, this is a gradient system, so you see that's a very stringent condition. In, in infinite dimension, it has almost uh, no chance to happen, right? But it's, it's still a quite important practice. And uh, yeah, so in basically we can, uh, you know, we can relate, in this case, we can relate gradient flows to, uh, to Nash equilibrium. Okay, so, so that's basically the first part. I uh, don't know if there are questions. Yeah? It's like you make an assumption that the variation of the strategy uh, must be equal to the variation of the cost function. Uh, right. 
So that's so called the is, best I reply think strategy. It's a strong assumption. It's strong. Yes, so that's uh, absolutely. That's, uh, uh, so I assume, I assume that the, I mean, it's, it's rather natural, you know, you, you have, a, so you have a set of possibilities, uh, you, can, you evaluate it in terms of, you know, your utility or your cost, and then you are going to go in the direction where you maximize the, the gain. So it's in some yeah. sense, uh, so it's a very, uh, it's a very commonly uh, maybe just made... Uh, there must be maybe... Uh, a coefficient for adjusting. Uh, so yes, yes, sense. absolutely. Research. Yeah, but you can put it in the phi j because uh, mm. you know it's. Uh, yeah, in fact, you have a you have a reactivity of the mm. the reactivity of the of the of the mm. agents to the. Uh, yeah, so that you could, but you could, you know, you could probably also put it into the the phi. And here we don't worry about any uh, uh, state uh, variable. In fact, uh, I will come back uh, to okay. to that later. Right, it's next. next uh, any other question? Yeah. Since, uh, since we have, has questions. Uh, in this equation, uh, does, how does this connect to the dynamics of the replicator? Can you? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I've ne never looked at that in detail, but yes, you, it's, a, it's a good. Uh, it's a, it would be a good. Uh, so, so, so in some like sense, the, uh, there is a little bit more complicated because the st states of the replicator are a little bit more than Nash equilibria. These are these as ESS, evolutionary stable states. Uh, we, we, we have, uh, we have uh, in mind, actually, in the future to look in, in, into greater details in this connection, but I, I, I can't answer right now. Right. Okay. Can I ask you another yeah. question? Uh, on, you kind of pass to the limit, continual limits, continuous mm -hmm. limits. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of go back now and perhaps get discrete systems from the continuous case? And yeah. Interesting so, so, so we haven't uh, made uh, any uh, kind of uh, rigorous study about the limit for, for a large number of particles of this. But there is a companion work by Blanchet and Carly, I think. They have looked at a, a specific uh, special case of, uh, um, of, uh, um, of, of, of a potential game related to, uh, I think, uh, uh, the allocation of uh, people in cities, and and they have they have uh, uh, looked at this question in detail, and it works. Of course, in the general case, you need to uh, make uh, some assumptions. Here, it's very general, so you have to make some assumptions on the phi and so the, the you know the regularity. And so, in this particular case, yes, they have looked at this, and it it works. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, and of course, then you have the symmetric uh, thing is that when you have the re, uh, the continuum uh, model, you could think of discretizing it using kind of particles and so recovering a kind of a discrete, uh, discrete system. I, I think that that's going to work provided you, you, you specify correctly the, uh, the assumptions. Okay, so now we, we, wanted, to, uh, we wanted to sort of uh, um, Build on the, our uh, expertise on, on kinetic theory to actually provide a kind of a sort of a, a new perspective to uh, to game theory. And so this the idea of of hydrodynamics. So the idea in kinetic theory, uh, so say for instance gas dynamics, what you have is you have a very complex systems with many molecules. You can describe them by uh, distribution function, which tells you how many particles in space and velocity you have. Uh, but at some point, you'd like to reduce the description into uh, just average quantities like uh, densities, velocities, and so on. And so you do a model reduction, uh, which is based on the fact that you have different scales in the system. And so there are fast scales, which are related to the uh, uh, molecular interactions between the particles. And these uh, fast scales actually equilibrate very fast the distribution to an equilibrium, which is in our case will be a Nash equilibrium. But this Nash equilibrium or this thermodynamical equilibrium still depends on slow variables. In the, in the case of, of gas dynamics, it's the density, the local mean velocity, the local temperature. And since these uh, uh, quantities are not, uh, say, spatial, spatially homogeneous, they have some gradients and so on, then this drives a slow evolution of the system, and that's precisely what's called the hydrodynamics. And this is how you get the 
equations for uh, gas, gas dynamics equations, for instance, like the Euler equations or the Navier-Stokes equations. And so we, we thought that maybe if we imagine that we have agents interacting, so there are some fast interactions that are described by these strategy variables, and then there are, uh, say, s slow variables that could be uh, spatial variables or that could be other variables ind indicated indicating, for instance, a social status or something that would sort of more slowly evolve according to, you know, some uh, spatially homogeneities of, the, of this Nash equilibrium. So we wanted to sort of try to uh, put this in some framework. And uh, this is uh, what we did here. So we, we assume that now we have another uh, variable, uh, which called, uh, uh, sometimes it's called a time variable, so we call it space. Suppose, for instance, that Y is the wealth of the agents, and they exchange wealth during you know, economic exchanges, and X is just their position. So you have different wealth distribution. In France, you have a certain wealth distribution. In, in US, you have another one, and maybe in Chile, and in China, and uh, you know, in whatever, Russia, you have different wealth distributions. Of course, then because of these differences of wealth, then that triggers some uh, dynamics. For instance, you have people migrating because you know, they want to uh, go to a more wealthy country, or you have money exchanges because immigrants uh, working in a wealthy country are going to send back money for their families. Uh, in, but these are more slow exchanges, right? Okay, so when you, when you go shopping, you do it daily. When you send money to your family, you maybe send it every month or something like that, right? So, so you have different cases, and when we wanted to actually try to apply this strategy to try to see how we could look at the evolution, the slow evolution of these equilibria over time, right? So this is the idea. So Y is the, still the strategy variable, and X is a kind of a space variable. It can be physical space, but it could be also social status. You would like to uh, write X as being like, you know, uh, uh, low, medium, or high class, and you know, how you move along the, the scale, or things, other things like that, right? Or education level, for instance, things like that, right? So, and we assume that, uh, each agent is able to uh, move in space according to a certain law, which depends on its own position and its own strategy. It could actually also depend on the other strategies and all the other positions. We, do not, we didn't, didn't take it into account here, but it could be easy to do it. And again, the uh, evolution of the strategy is the same as before, except that the cost function now also depends on the whole list of positions of all the other agents, right? So this basically now is a coupled system of differential equation and SDE and the ODE. Here we could have added also some diffusion right, as well. We didn't do it, but we could have done. I mean, it's not really important what you do here. You will recover the, the thing at the end. Um, so doing it at the kinetic level in the case of the continuum uh, of players, you have a function of position and strategy and time. And now you have that the evolution in space gives rise to this additional operator uh, uh, divergence of Vx, Yf. And this is the operator we had before that described the evolution in strategy. And again, now phi f is a cost function. It depends on x and y and on the distribution of all the other agents, right? And so the goal is we'd like to actually provide a model reduction, assuming that you have a fast um, you have a fast uh, uh, dynamics for these variables and you sort of reach a Nash equilibrium for this operator and then these uh, drift term here will drive a slow evolution of the system in space. And so this drift term will be, uh, this drift in space will be actually characterized by the slow evolution of some moments of F such as the mean density, so if I integrate all the over all strategy variables for particles at a given point, or say, for instance, here, the, the mean strategy variable. So that's the, the total density of agents, and that's the mean, uh, so the, the, the upsilon f here is the mean strategy of the agents at a given location x. That's, that's, these are examples of the variables we would like to monitor in uh, the uh, uh, hydrodynamic equations. Uh, yeah, so I have put some, uh, 
slides about mean field games to show uh, the I mean, connections and the differences. I'm not going to go into the details of this because there has been uh, many uh, talks about mean field games already. Just let me, uh, let me point out that uh, in a recent work, we were able to actually show that there is a, a, a connection between mean field games in our approach. So the idea of mean field games is that you are going to uh, do a, a control of a whole trajectory. Whereas this best reply strategy means you are making a, you're not making a really control. You're controlling over a very short interval of time. So what, you, what we prove is that if we take the uh, mean field game of, of uh, La Serie and Lyons and we chop the control into a small interval of time, then we recover our, uh, our, our framework. Right? So, so obviously, if we compare the optimality of a mean field game to what we do, we are suboptimal because uh, you know if you if you make successive uh, optimization of a small interval of time, it's, you're not going to get the global minimum as if you do the optimization of the whole uh, interval of uh, the whole time horizon. Um, however, it turns out that for uh, for our view, viewpoint, for our perspective, in some cases, it makes more sense. So if you think of pedestrians moving in the street. They are not going to optimize uh, the trajectory over, you know, 60 minutes. It's not possible, right? So it's more like, you know, a really local control, right? So, um, so this is uh, then a matter of uh, which kind of model you uh, you are intending uh, to do, right? Okay. So here, going back to this uh, question of of. Uh, um, reducing the, uh, the, uh, the, the model, uh, we are going to implement this uh, idea that the dynamics in Y is much faster than the dynamics in X. So that's the main hypothesis. There is a scale separation hypothesis. The variation of strategy Y is much faster than the, that of the type X. So we're going to reach a fast equilibration of strategy through to a local Nash equilibrium and then leading to a slow evolution in space. And to, um, to implement this uh, scale separation, we need to introduce a small parameter that describes the, basically the ratio of the time scale. So epsilon is the uh, time scale of the strategy interaction, say for instance, wealth exchanges between the agents when you regard it into unit of time, which is the a global evolution of the system, a year, for instance, right? So it's very small. And so that's the scale separation in time. And we also need a scale separation in space in the sense that we assume that most of the exchanges that occur in strategy occur between people that are located in the same area, right? So we are assuming that the cost function at leading order, so there may be a small uh, remainder that takes into account non-local exchanges, but at leading order is going to be a function of the local value of the density of particles at x and the, not the total uh, f, but the conditional distribution f condition on the fact that you are uh, at location x. So it's essentially only the, um, the, the distribution, the, the strategy distribution for particles which are at the location X, right? So we are only taking agents, we, uh, we are only exchanging you know, wealth with agents which are really near to us, right? When we go shopping. So it's not entirely true because, of course, when you buy a German car or whatever, uh, <clears throat> a Chinese computer, then you are doing non local exchanges, but in some sense, you are doing you're buying cars much less often than bread, right? So, uh, you know, this may be like not, not very often, right? So, uh, of course, you can dispute this kind of hypothesis, but this is the, the, the frame we, 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 we decided to work. So, essentially, the cost function is totally local in X here, so at leading order. And so, we end up with uh, an equation that we can write like so. We divide in my epsilon. We have here the slow, slow exchanges that are in space and the fast exchanges in, in strategy variable y. And this operator now, because the, uh, well, because the, um, uh, the cost function depends only locally on, uh, on x, it, 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 it's, it's actually an operator that operates only on the y variable, right? x is, and t is only a parameter now here. 
And so you can actually look at the zeros of this uh, operator, and that's going to give you uh, Nash equilibrium exactly in the same K as in the same uh, framework as we did before. Where, of course, you will have, so nu is again the condition on distribution of f condition on the position x. Uh, so you're, you're giving by assuming that you instantaneously, when epsilon goes to zero, when epsilon goes to zero, you would need to, uh, to stay on the manifold of equilibrium q of f equals zero. So you need actually that f is proportional with the density rho to an, a, a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so a, a fixed point of this equation, right? So of course, to solve this equation, you need to specify what the, 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 the shape of phi is. I'm going to give an example in a minute. Just bear with me for, uh, for a second. Suppose that we can solve this, right? So what can we do? Uh, we need to now to know, so you see here, for instance, we have this quantity, rho of xt, which is not specified by uh, our Nash equilibrium solution, so we need to find an equation for rho, right? But the equation for rho is readily, is readily found because if you integrate with respect to y, you average the equation out with respect to the strategy variable, q is a divergence in y, so when you integrate, it goes away. And so you're going to get rid, when you integrate in y, you're going to get rid of this uh, singular term. And so this is how you get the continuity equation. So if you integrate with respect to y, you get this equation here. So rho is the uh, same density as here, so this local density, right? And now the flux of the rho, the flux in space, is given by rho u, and u is the average of the uh, particle velocity v of x y this uh, this function which is here averaged over the Nash equilibrium right so if you know locally the Nash equilibrium you can average this guy and you know the local velocity of the agents and then you get the the way the density evolves right but the problem is that maybe maybe and in practice this is what happens maybe the Nash equilibria are not uniquely specified by this equation, right? So there might actually be not only a unique solution of these guys, but there may be actually families of solutions of, of these guys, right? And so families parameterized by something. And so you need also to find uh, how, uh, which, which object in this family are picked up by the limit of the problem. So in order to, uh, to examine this question, I cannot do it in, the, in full generality. I need to specify a certain dynamics, a certain cost function. So I'm now going, going to give you an example of what can be done beyond finding just the continuity equation here. And that example actually is um, an example that we took from a model of wealth distribution. And uh, it goes like this. So it was a model which was first proposed by Bouchou and Meza, and then it was uh, further uh, studied by Cordier, Paresky, Toscani, and During and Toscani. So again, we find we start with the same with the same equations. And so what we are going to do is we are going to specify the cost function, right? So we specify the f f cost function. So nu is the is the distribution is the uh, is, is, is the distribution, um, is the normalized, is, is the conditional distribution uh, condition on the fact that the particles at position x. So we assume that the cost function is this integral here. So in practice, that means that the strength of exchanges between the agents, so the agents exchange wealth, and the amount of wealth exchanged is, is uh, proportional to the difference of their wealth to the square. Don't ask me to justify this model. Uh, these are very famous people, and, and it's there. Okay, so, uh, but this is uh, this is the, the you know the, the the rule. The rule is this. Uh, it turns out that you can write this uh, as the just uh, the difference between the local value of y and the average of nu, of y over nu, so which I called uh, epsilon nu. So it's just this difference y minus epsilon squared 
with a certain uh, rate kappa, right? The other modification we make is that we are, uh, we are uh, uh, using a geometric Brownian motion in order to, uh, to take into account the finance context and keep the y variable positive, right? So this is not standard Brownian motion, but it's ge geometric Brownian motion. Uh, so ba basically, this is the same equation. And the, uh, the, the thing that you can, you can notice on this equation is that not only when you integrate with respect to y, you get 0 because of the derivative of y here, but also when you mul pre-multiply by y, this q of f, and integrate over y, you get 0. This is due to the special shape of the interaction here. So what that guy mean, means that the mean wealth is preserved during the interactions, right? So this is, uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the total wealth. The total wealth and, and, and consequently the mean wealth because the, the total number of agents is conserved. So the total wealth and the mean wealth are conserved during the interaction. So this is called a conservative economy. So each time somebody loses something, someone gets the, uh, the, the thing that the other has lost. There is no uh, money that's lost in the blue. Right? Like sometimes it happens when you have a crisis. So it's not very realistic, right? But it's, it's, very, it's, it's very nice because it allows you to simplify things. And so you see that this, uh, this identity allows you actually to get another conservation, not only the mass, but actually the conservation of the mean wealth. And that's going to be very important because when you're looking at now the Nash equilibria of this game, what you find is uh, functions that are uh, basically related to the uh, uh, gamma distribution or the inverse gamma distribution. So it's basically a, a something that has a Pareto tail. So when, when uh, y goes to infinity, that decays like a power law, right? So it's basically a Pareto distribution. And that's the one that's provided by the equilibrium of this, uh, of this game, right? And, and of course, uh, you can, uh, the, 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 the cost for the, for the game associated with this Nash equilibria is given by this. So compared to the previous formula, it's a little bit more complicated because of, Brownian, of the geometric Brownian motion, but basically it's, it's the same idea. So again, you see that the cost essentially is uh, proportional to the mean wealth here. So that's uh, the, uh, uh, the formula for the cost. Okay, so when you do that, you see that this distribution has two, there are two parameters. There is the mean, the, the, the density in front of, so for any location, you have the number of agents that you have to know, but you have also to know this parameter y, or epsilon, which is the uh, mean wealth at the uh, prescribed location, right? So you have two parameters to determine rho and epsilon, okay? And so you will need two uh, equation in space and time to determine how these two parameters rho and epsilon evolve, right? And so how are you going to get that? You're going to get that just by integrating this equation over y, that's going to give you the equation for rho, and uh, pre-multiply by y and integrate it with respect to y using this uh, cancellation property, and this is going to give you the equation for the mean wealth. And so this is what you, what you do here, and so what you get is that your system, the limit uh, when epsilon goes to zero, the system is completely characterized by the fact that the limit distribution is this uh, fat Pareto tail distribution with mean density rho and mean wealth epsilon that's evolved according to this set of equations. And the spatial variation here is monitored by u0 and u1, which are again averages of this uh, uh, function that tells you how uh, agents move in space, average over the Nash equilibrium here. And for the density, it's just V uh, average over the Nash equilibrium. And for the mean wealth, it's just V average over the Nash equilibrium multiplied by Y, right? So you get here an equation that completely specifies the slow evolution of the, uh, say, the mean quantities of the, of the, of the population. All right, so now, uh, to do, go a little bit further, uh, we would like to get rid of this uh, kind of unphysical assumption that trading preserves wealth, 
right? So it's not really true. We know, all know that during trading you may have you know, loss, net loss or net gain of total wealth, right? So we cooked up a model which is inspired by the previous model but which doesn't uh, need to satisfy the um, uh, total wealth conservation. So essentially we, we, we took the model by Bouchon and Meza, but we just modified, the, we take a, a cost function which is still quadratic in Y in the, in, the, in the wealth, but now the coefficients are a little bit different. Right? So essentially you have the two important coefficients. This is a constant which is in essential. You, you have this A and the B here. So the A is this guy. So what is now epsilon 2 is actually related to the variance of the wealth. So the variance is actually epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 squared. Okay? And, and so you see that this variance you know, when this variance is, is small, then A is large, which means that trading is fast, and when the variance is large, then trading is slow. So it's a kind of a uh, uh, risk aversion uh, strategy where players do not play when the market is uh, very uh, uncertain, when the variance is large, uh, whereas they, they play uh, fast when the market, market is certain, right? And the second one is actually cooked up in, in such a way that what I'm going to show next is true, okay? So this is not, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, but essentially this is, uh, so the important thing is that in this case you don't have a conservation of, of a total mean wealth, right? So you can show that you have the same kind of equilibria in those gamma distribution. Uh, again, you have uh, the three parameters, which is uh, y, epsilon, which is the mean, uh, the mean wealth that you need to determine. And now the problem is how are you going to, to get an equation for the mean wealth? Because now you don't have this uh, previous trick that you could uh, integrate uh, the equation against y, use the uh, total uh, conservation of wealth to get rid of this guy and get an equation. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, to, to tell you the, the, the story because it's a long story, but it, it turns out that relying on previous work we did on, 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 um, on, um, on flocking, on flocking models, we can actually find a way to bypass this, uh, this, this problem and find what we call generalized collision invariance because these functions, the y that I multiply against the q to get zero, in kinetic theory is called a collision invariant. But we don't have enough collision invariants here, but we could find a kind of a surrogate collision invariant which is called the generalized collision invariant. Uh, here it's called generalized because in this case the quantity that satisfies conserved that, that cancels the q when you integrate against it is this guy, and you see that depends on the distribution itself. So it's not really a true collision invariant because it depends on on the distribution itself. But in any case, when you multiply the equation by this guy, the Q cancels, and this is how you get the equation for the, for the mean wealth. So in the end, um, you, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you, you cancel the, the, the Q, so you get rid of the singular term, and you get an equation that you can express. You have to, to do some computations. In the end, you get an equation which is in this form, so again you have uh, uh, an equation for the density rho, an equation for the mean wealth, but note that now it's not a conservative equation, it's not a dx of something because you don't have uh, total wealth conservation, uh, but still you have, you are able to compute all the terms and you are able to uh, determine the uh, slow evolution of the parameters of the equilibria, or the Nash equilibria, the rho and the, and the epsilon, right? So that's basically the, the story I wanted to tell. So the example I've shown here is maybe not really very solid in terms of application, uh, in terms of economics, but we are trying to, uh, we are working with uh, somebody from the business school in Imperial to actually apply this kind of uh, concept to um, uh, essentially um, uh, 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 firm, strategies of firms uh, um, in, in front of climate change. So this is a, a big pro pro program and we have a, going to have a PhD student working on this. So more story later, but uh, I wanted to, to, sh to, to explain a little bit the kind of a framework, right? So that's basically what I wanted to, uh, to, to say. Thank you very much. Um, 
So I just wanted to ask, uh, earlier you mentioned what you're solving isn't exactly a mean field problem. It's a short-term mean field problem. And as right. I was wondering, can you comment on how it compares to the solution of a mean field problem as you know, the length of time increases? Uh, that's a that's a that's a, that's a difficult question, right? Because um, uh, in, in general, uh, what what you what you can show about convergence of mean field models is 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 for finite times, right? So for finite times, so 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 in some sense, uh, when you increase the time horizon. Uh, somehow you have to either to increase the number of particles more and more, or uh, you know to to make the perturbation parameters smaller and smaller. So you you don't in general you don't have uniformity with respect to this. So which means that if you're taking a a given system and compare it with the mean field, then you uh, you you expect a drift in time, and in 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 the end maybe maybe the equilibria will be different. Uh, it's 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 not. I mean, the situation may not be as bad, and I think it's really depending on, depending on case case by case. Uh, uh, but uh, this is a very difficult question, and people are working on that, and uh, it's not solved yet. Yeah, that's. Uh, It's a technical question for the slide 25, the first equation, in fact, when you deal with the, um, um, what you call the collision operator. When you introduce the um, collision operator indexed by, uh, ah, it's applied to F, uh, epsilon. I didn't understand this. Uh, when you divide by epsilon, I didn't well understand this. Ah, mm. so because uh, uh, previously, uh, so when you do, a, so you you make a, a, a change of time scales, a time and space scale. So basically, what you're looking at, so so assume that you're looking at, you know, a worldwide uh, problem, right? But the agents are interacting, you know, in a city, right? So you have a very different scale of your system and on the scale where the ag agent interact. So this ratio between the local scale and the global scale, I call it epsilon. So when I write the, the equations, when I wrote the equation previously, like uh, here, for instance, basically, since all the terms are, say, order one, that means that basically I'm, on, I'm looking at a scale which is uh, the scale of the agents, right, of the, order, of, of the order of the interaction of the agents. But now I want to place myself on the global scale. So I'm going to change scale, I'm going to change x, to epsilon x and t to epsilon t because I also want to look at the large time scale. And that brings an epsilon in front of the DTF and an epsilon in front of the grad xf, right? So this is the reason why you get this epsilon here. So that's the scale separation in time and space. And also in order to be able to, uh, to say something, I have also to to assume that the dynamics itself is going to favor this scale separation, otherwise it's not going to be true. And so to, to enforce that, I'm assuming that the cost function is at leading order a cost function uh, depending only on the value of the distribution at the given location x, plus maybe some non-local terms, but which I assume small, right? So this assumption actually is consistent with this change of scale. Right, which means that when I let epsilon go to zero, I can first look at the equilibria of this guy. These, the equilibria of this guy depend on some parameters unknown, and these parameters, the rho and the epsilon, are going to evolve on the slow time scale, the t and the x, according to what this operator is going to tell me. Right. So that's uh, how it how it goes. So this is why, in the end, the equation for rho and epsilon involve uh, the moments of this guy. So here you have reached an equilibrium, so only what matters is only the Nash equilibrium. But now here you are not reaching an equilibrium, so you're still evolving, so the dynamics will involve uh, some averages of V over the Nash equilibrium of this guy. 
Okay. More questions? All right, so let's thank you again.